we are very pleased today, very grateful to uh, uh, Kate Romanier to be with us uh, today to talk uh, a bit about her work and uh, uh, how it relates to school reform. Uh, uh, Kate is uh, the Professor of Social Foundations of Education and uh, um, chair still, yes, of the Department of Education. No, not chair anymore. Uh, not chair anymore. Hey. Former chair of the Department of Educational Leadership uh, at Miami University, uh, a graduate of Teachers College, Columbia University, uh, and um, a significant contributor to the field, a former president of History of Education Society, uh, and, and numerous other positions of uh, recognition in the field. So very glad to have you here, Kay. Thank you. Um, and I should say also someone, an old friend from, from grad school days, which is a yep. special We're treat to the grad school thing. together. <laughs> um, so, as you know, this series is meant to try to share the insights of historians um, with, uh, uh, in terms of the, the kinds of issues in school reform. And you're particularly in a good position to be doing that because I know a lot of your other work uh, has you actively engaged in um, uh, schools, uh, working with practitioners, um, and also, if I can, since it's public knowledge, I can also say, also as a, as a public servant, as vice mayor of the city of Oxford, Ohio, uh, which is wonderful and adds a, a particular additional uh, public profile and, and involvement. So, given that most humans probably aren't going to be studying the history of education and certainly won't <laughs> be doing it in the depth and, and uh, uh, panache that you've brought to it, um, what should be the... What are some of the headlines that you would say you've uh, you've taken away from this work? I love that idea of the headlines of the history of education. <laughs> First of all, the news flashes. Right. All right. Here's a news flash. I learned this from my dissertation that I did when I was a student with you, uh, and I wrote a dissertation. I looked at school teachers in New York City in the 1920s and how they responded to school reform initiatives. And people said, why New York City? Why the 1920s? Well, one reason was that in the 1920s there was a huge flood of school reform initiatives from the city, the state, and to somewhat less extent, the federal government. So I wanted to know how teachers responded to school reform initiatives. And I interviewed a lot of retired teachers and asked them about that, did a lot of archival work. And I found out that... Uh, a lot of what most teachers talked about was that they resisted, adapted, or accommodated to the school reform initiatives that were given to them. In other words, uh, school reform is created in offices far away from the classroom, far away from the schoolhouse, and then it's delivered to the schoolhouse door. And then teachers take that school reform and they resist, adapt, or accommodate it to what they know makes sense in the classroom and what they believe is going to be most effective for their teaching and for their children. So I say, ironically, it's a news flash because when, when, when teachers read this book, they go, yeah, like that's just what I did today in the classroom. And so then the question is, why did that happen almost 100 years ago and why is it still happening now? And so the message I have, many of us have for school reformers, is that if they want to develop some school reform, they might want to talk to people who are working in schools and talk about how it is that uh, you may actually implement what you think is a great idea, sitting in some office someplace else, uh, how is it actually going to be implemented in the school? Then, um, uh, most recently I wrote a book about the history of school principals. So my first work, book was about the history of school teachers, and then I became a department chair and began to think about administration and what it's like to be an administrator in higher education. And since we also run a program that prepares uh, people to be school principals, I want to explore the history of school principals. And I found a similar dynamic at work, and anyone who's uh, watching this who's a school principal may may recognize this, that school principals are essentially middle managers stuck in the middle of a huge bureaucratic system, really at the nexus between policy and practice. The school board at the district or the state or the federal level says, here's a great idea, they give it to your principals and they say, now go implement it. And the principals have this reform, but they also have a body of teachers and students and secretaries and, and all sorts of people, parents and community members, with whom they have to negotiate and sort of facilitate the implementation of that school reform. And so that also involves re resistance, adaptation, and accommodation. So there's no direct line between the creation of educational policy and actual practice. 
And this really shouldn't surprise us because schools are really complicated places. So I suppose as a historian, what I, what's helpful about writing history about this type of thing is that, is that I think sometimes people can recognize a problem better when it's not an ex something that they are experiencing themselves. So when people read about these problems of school reform in the 1920s or farther, be farther before, they're thinking about something that's a little more objectified to their own experience, and then they're able to apply it to their own experience. So when you tell a principal right now that they're a middle manager in the middle of the system, they may say, yeah, well, whatever, what am I going to do about it? But when you talk about the history of the experience and how it's been traveling, going this way for a long time, it uh, gives us a few lessons and maybe insights into alternative ways that we could have gone, we still could be going in terms of school reform and school policy development. So the... the, uh, the yeah, that resonates with a lot of folks, um, and it recalls uh, actually conversations about those school teachers as you were as you were digging that up, uh, some uh, like at least two or three years ago, <coughs> as that happened. Um, the so you talk about this resistance, adaptation, and accommodation. And I have uh, two questions. One is, do you see any? Um, I can imagine school reform uh, a colleague saying, "Well, yes, but are there some that they?" Uh, accommodate more than others, adapt more than others, resist more than others, or are there shifts and patterns of this as you've seen it over time, or uh, are there factors within the particular context in which it's happening that you think are are suggestive of what we ought to be we learning from from looking at these? As you've looked at a number of individual lives rather closely, it seems to me, in, 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 uh -huh. in these in these categories, is there is there anything there as you've sifted through that in the mix of these three kinds of reactions to reform by the teachers or principals? Yes. I think um, one of the immediate reactions to some of the work that I've done is people say, well, then we should get rid of educational policy and, and teachers should be able to run their own schools. But in fact, when you talk to teachers and teacher leaders and school principals in the past, what they are often articulating is a need for some kind of um, central, almost common, guidance in how they should be doing their work. That would be at the core, maybe, of their work. Maybe at, maybe yeah, at the yeah. core of their work. <laughs> they often say that, that it's not that I'm opposed to my principal or my superintendent telling me what to do. I just want them to tell me what to do in a way that is consistent, that is, that is common across the school and across the district, and uh, that makes sense to me as a teacher. So that, that really rings through over the whole history of education, that teachers are, are looking for guidance. It's not like we walk into a classroom and immediately know what we're doing at all. At least I didn't when I became a teacher. I really wanted guidance, but I wanted guidance that made uh, sense, and that it made sense between me and my students and, 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 and also my colleagues who I worked with. Um, and teacher leaders have argued for that as well. So another body of research that I've been exploring was the history of, or was the biography of a teacher union leader, Margaret Haley, who founded the first teachers union in the United States in Chicago in the early 20th century. And her argument also was that teachers needed support, and they needed uh, support and they needed respect, because her argument, uh, like the great philosopher John Dewey, was that education is part of community and it's part of civic society. And so teachers need to be supported as agents of our, of our nation, of our, of our community and of our nation, um, and uh, given the kind of support. And in her case, she was interested, like many people are, in terms of compensation. So teachers need to be paid what they deserve, uh, but they also need to be given other kinds of supports, from supportive teachers to supportive curriculum materials to also uh, pensions that will help them in their later in life. So, um, so that's a common theme also, that... Uh, the teachers need to be uh, given the kinds of supports that can help them develop the kind of work that they believe will be effective for children. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Some would also suggest um, I, I, one of these other uh, conversations had to do with uh, was a conversation with uh, uh, our colleague uh, David Lavery, who um, suggests that part of what is new. Uh, in recent school reform has been uh, the design such that it has allows for less wiggle across the resistance adaptation accommodation uh, that it is meant to make a, a famously 
loosely coupled system more tightly linked. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm wondering if you can, can help us get a sense of that or what's your read of that in terms of how that has been playing out, how you see patterns of that. Is that an old claim maybe that's coming up again and everyone thinks that the reform that's hitting them is another effort to tightly couple and they wiggle out of it or is this mm -hmm. something different or what are your thoughts? I think that this 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 system of trying to tighten up the loosely coupled system is has been going on for a long time. And it may be more um, extreme now, um, but certainly when you listen to teachers talk about the 1920s and other periods in the past, they also felt that it was the most extreme. So, so I don't really know how to gauge that. You know, we're dealing, for example, right now with technology, which is somewhat more either invasive or all-encompassing of the classroom. So that makes the intensity, maybe, of the form somewhat different of the reform, something different than maybe it was um, in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. But um, in both cases, uh, I use what's called the uh, fire engine example, which I learned from one of the teachers who I interviewed in the 1920s. She was given a curriculum to give to her fourth grade kids, and she had to follow a very strict curriculum. This is in like 1920. She had to follow a very strict curriculum on this day because her principal was coming in the next day and was going to evaluate her. And so the kids had to do one, two, three, four, five, six steps, you know, on this day. Well, she'd gotten to about step two, and there was a fire outside, and the fire engine started running by the windows. So these are elementary school kids. So what do elementary kids do? They run to the window to look at the fire engine. She turned it into a teachable moment, you know, learning about fire engines, but she also then lost the curriculum that she was supposed to be following. Mm -hmm. So there's still fire engines out today. Kids are still running to the <laughs> window to look at fire engines when they run by. And um, and the intensity of the, of the curriculum is undermined, whether it was in 1920 or 2014, mm -hmm. um, in that same way. And you mentioned you mentioned your, your uh, uh, early book on Haley. Um, <clears throat> and certainly the question of, of uh, 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 Unions and, and education and school reform uh, is a long-standing one. Um, although, well, perhaps you know the, you know those literature better than I do, but I mean, it, it, not necessarily a deep literature on the history around unions and, and uh, teaching. But um, I'm wondering how you understand that. We seem to have experienced, uh, well, we have experienced a larger uh, period of deunionization of certain sectors, um, and some, uh, of course, uh, critics of current reform directions would say that, that it really is a a pretty clear attempt to try to deunionize, a, a, you know, a, a holdout public unionized sector. Mm -hmm. um, how do you locate that uh, the the unionization effort, um, the its role uh, within either as a resistance, accommodation, or adaptation uh, element for school yeah. reforms and such? Unions are such a complicated. <laughs> and controversial issue. I mean, a couple of things I want to say about unions today. One is that unions are what they are today in part because of legal policy that was set up by state and federal law in the past 50 years. So the restrictions that are on both school systems and on unions have been set up from the past. And so those are not the, the fault of an individual union leader who's in your school district today. It's a system that's developed over time. And maybe that system needs to change. Um, but um, the important thing about unions is that they uh, represent the interests of teachers. And until school districts and communities decide that they want to represent the interests of teachers, I believe that we still need teacher unions. Um, teaching is such a complicated uh, occupation, and it's, it's complicated. One of the complications is that everybody thinks it's easy because we were all in school and we saw teachers. So we think we know what it means to be a teacher. But really only teachers know what it means to be a teacher. Mm. I was in a first grade classroom last week and I couldn't believe the amount of work that woman was doing for half an hour in a first grade classroom and just the intensity of that labor. But most of us haven't been in a first grade classroom since we were in first grade. So we don't understand the nature of that work. So until people really understand what teaching d does, t what teachers do, then uh, I think we need unions to best represent teachers um, and to talk about what they what what teachers need and deserve. Um, but that certainly doesn't doesn't erase the fact that there are certain policy um, 
and legal practices that restrict teachers. Although, as a teacher union friend of mine says, if teacher unions do not hire bad teachers, school districts hire bad teachers. So a lot of times the finger gets pointed at teacher unions and we may need to remember who actually is running the system. Right, right. <laughs> and that certain things like tenure actually predate unions. <laughs> right, they predate unions. And the tenure wasn't a, an idea of school boards. It was the school administrators who wanted tenure because they figured they could cut a deal with teachers. They'd say, well, we won't pay you much money, but we'll give you tenure. Right. And and that was explicit in the definition of tenure in both K-12 and in higher education where we are right now. So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. given our advanced degrees, we are paid less than others in private industry, but we do have and we may have an advantage of tenure. So it was an idea that was created as a as a social benefit, as a as a welfare system, you know, advantage for educators. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. 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 And there are other people who have tenure too: judges, uh, police. A lot of civil service workers, so mm -hmm. it's very mm -hmm. common. Actually, more common than we think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they should keep their eyes open for uh, reform efforts in their area. No. Yeah. The, 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 um, so one of the things that, that I, I, I think you do a, a marvelous job at is, is sort of trying to, in, in very um, biographical ways, and with sort of a lot of uh, uh, details of actual lives uh, that, get, that come through your writing, um, talk about these positions, and in, and I guess what I might want to ask about is this uh, role that educators play between uh, very individual lives, uh, uh, local communities, uh, families, and so forth, and what they're looking for, and the larger level of societal demands and expectations uh, that there that we make upon this institution, and therefore these individuals who who work there. Um, I'm wondering if you if, if that calls to mind any particular lives that you've looked at over time. Um, this idea of sort of how do we how might we uh, help people see how that plays out? Um, you know, I love by the way the quote that you had in the in your recent book about the you know these hard charging individuals that have been school principals for years and years. It's messy. It's complex, and it has always been that way. Yeah. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could help us uh, uh, paint a picture of some of that kind of complexity, especially as That's this, why I really, uh, I, the, uh, first I love teachers, and I used to always love teachers, but now I really love school principals because their lives are more <laughs> complex than even teachers. I mean, that's what surprised me so much. And the case that most comes to mind was the case of African-American school leaders uh, before desegregation in the, in the southern United States. So here are African-American educated men and women who are leading schools that are by law in the South, uh, by law and, and by practice, racially segregated. They have less money than the white schools. They have no power. They have very little authority. And yet, even in this isolated and uh, marginalized community, these African-American leaders led these wonderful uh, institutions where they encouraged students, they encouraged teachers, they got parents involved, they're incredible uh, community institutions. And Vanessa Siddle Walker talks about this most powerfully in her work on African American principles. But the, so that's wonderful. But then it gets really painful because when Brown versus Board of Education comes in, and finally most or some southern districts were forced to desegregate, that meant that all of these virtually all of these African-American school principals lost their jobs because under desegregation what white school boards did was close the black school and move all the black kids into the white school. So if you were an African-American school administrator in that time, you might support racial segregation more than integration because you might say, you know what, I've got kids in my school here, we don't have a lot of money, we don't have a lot of power, but we have a great community going on. And when this legal integration happens, which is, of course, the best thing to have happen, it means our school is closing, I'm losing my job, and all my students are moving into a very hostile, potentially very hostile environment. So those school principals, who most of whom lost their jobs and often were demoted to positions like a assistant principal under a white principal or coach or teacher or guidance counselor, they were the bravest of people because they sacrificed their own professional integrity 
for what they knew would be the long-term benefit for children because they believed that integration, most for the most part, believed that uh, racial integration would be good for their children and for society. But that tension they felt must have just been incredible um, because they, they gave up their jobs and what they were doing as wonderful leaders in order to abide by what the law that they believed was correct. Mm-hmm. So those I wrote a few biographies of those people and, and the real uh, political and I, I imagine really emotional and social tension that they felt. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of principals feel that way now too. In the last chapter of the principals book where I came up to sort of contemporary time, I I talked about some principals who were dealing with uh, standardized testing and how they have to force their teachers to force their children to do these massive testing regimes because if they the students do well on the test then the school will do better and then the whole community will uh, do better and yet the principal often knows that this is not the best in the best interest at the immediate time for those students and those teachers and yet he or she has to also by law and policy, if he or she wants to keep her job, has to keep going this way. So I think sort of in that office is a lot of, um, it's a lot of strain, it's a lot of um, ethical dilemmas that they have to face, thinking about what's good for now and what's good for the future, what they are required to do by their, by their, their job contract, what they're required to do by the law, and what they think is best for kids. Hmm. They're fascinating people. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. So... Given that, and given that one of the things that seems is, is high on the uh, agenda for many people is how do we actually um, assess how these folks are doing? Uh, how do we evaluate? Um, and with a nod to saying, yes, we want to be supportive, but we want to hold people accountable and so forth. How do, we, how do you locate that uh, effort uh, historically? Um, I always love to remember that there was a piece, and, I, and I'm trying to remember the, the historian who pulled it out, it was... A, it was um, about, it was in, in history of rural schools where they found the, the grading of schools that was occurring in the first decades of the uh, 20th century, where they would actually hammer the letter grade on the front of the school. Uh, uh, oh, Illinois. Okay. So there's been one some some wonderful precedents for all of these things as we uh, as we shaming these public yeah. shaming. Public shaming. That was it was it was part of their lo- they were explicit about that logic. Yeah, the change logic. Um, but how do you so how do we under, how can we better understand that? Um, the current kind of language around accountability and evaluation. Uh, are there some historical precedents to that? Are there some, at least, lessons and guidance from that? Uh, how should we, it just seems so much a part of the current conversation, I'm wondering, as you look over over time, uh, what thoughts occur to you? Um, authentic assessment occurs to me. Um, and what I mean by th- authentic assessment is what we think about in curriculum as well, which is an assessment, you know, 360-degree assessment of how a whole school is doing. Um, students, teachers, uh, janitor, parents, community, the whole community. How is the whole community doing? Um, I believe the reason we have not gone in that direction historically up to today is that such assessment costs a lot of money. And we are spending a lot of money on our schools. Uh, I just heard a, uh, a lecture somebody gave about the amount of money that the federal government is giving for various race to the top programs. Um, but I think the mo- so there is there is money out there. People often say there's not enough money to do this kind of work in schools. I think there is money out there. I think the money's being spent in very narrow assessment ways right now with the testing focus. And I believe in that case, David Library is correct. The emphasis on student testing is more extreme now than it has ever been. Um, And I don't think that's a good idea because there's more going on in schools. There's the fire engine incident, you know. How do we evaluate the importance of the education that happened when the fire engine came by and the kids ran to the window and the teacher explained to them what was going on? An authentic assessment program of a school, of a whole school, would do that. Uh, more effectively than testing kids. But I have to say, I always feel inadequate when people ask me this question because I don't have the answer. And so this is where I rely on educational policy folks to read the history of education and then for them to develop the policy that might make this happen. Um, Because I know how to look at the past and assess what's happened in the past, and I know 
I know a fair amount about schools today, but I don't really know how to make that kind of change happen today. Mm-hmm. I do think I share ideas with a lot of people about what's not working. Um, and I think that we can learn from history, but I, I always wish I could give you the silver bullet answer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can't. <laughs> I kind of guess that would be the case. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So one of the things that you've also, you know, that's been a part of this profession in the field have been the, the um, questions around uh, gender, questions around the, the role of women, especially as teaching became more of a, a female profession, um, as administration uh, clearly did not in the same way, uh, and all the various other kinds of echoes of both uh, the professional structure, what the particular roles were about, um, as well as... Uh, I mean, obviously a huge area in terms of just what we meant schools to be about and and, uh, in terms of curriculum, in terms of relation to what families were doing and so forth. But but let me just concentrate for a moment on the the professional roles, uh, those of teachers, uh, and uh, first, I suppose, and then later perhaps turn to administrators. But in terms of um, how you understand and what we ought to be keeping in mind from the history of this profession that has a particular... uh, um, uh, from which we can learn a lot by, by looking through certain gender lenses, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's important to remember always that in the mid-19th century, when Horace Mann, who was the commissioner of education in Massachusetts, one of the first really significant state commissioners of education, who is sort of the architect of the modern public school system, you might say, that he designed what he saw as the modern public school system, specifically pinpointing women to be teachers, Uh, One reason was that he believed that women were caring individuals, and this would allow schools to become more caring places, which I think was a good idea. But the other thing that he said explicitly was that women could be paid less. Women will demand less money, and also they seem to be, in his mind, a little more malleable, and so you could tell women teachers what they were going to do. So that's the origin of the feminization of teaching. That's why women went into teaching because there were school leaders who said who identified women as good teachers for both good reasons and also for I think really dangerous region reasons which is that women could be paid less and could be expected to do less because they were seen as being more malleable so that fit right into the groove of how women who through the 19th century up till through today are moving are in professions we are professional creatures as much as, you know, we've ever been now than we were before, and yet still women are paid less and are often seen as less knowledgeable and um, and important than men. So it's a sort of gendered, it's a very much a gendered theme that's gone through the history of education and the history of teaching. So that plays into why people may not think teaching is that important, why teaching is easy, um, why teaching is just you, you don't need to be trained to be a teacher. All you have to do is care about kids. So you don't need to go through a long training process. It's not like becoming a, a brain surgeon where you have to learn something. This is what people would say. Um, you can just naturally become a natural teacher. And I don't think that's true at all. But I think that because of the feminization of teaching, it was easier for the public to begin to think that and still believe that in many ways. I see that in my own, in the teacher education classes here at my university. Most of the elementary school, aspiring elementary school teachers are young women, and many of them are just lining up in this same ideology, and they're saying, yeah, I like kids, I'm real, you know, I'm, I'm learning things, but I mostly just love kids, and I think teaching sounds like kind of a nice job, and then I'll move on to it, and then maybe I'll get married and have kids. So they, that may actually happen to them, but the fact that the profession has followed that line of thinking is what's been dangerous, really, and not, I don't think, a good thing for schools. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying women aren't good teachers. I'm just saying that the way the whole kind of conception of the occupation has been shaped in that way has been not good. Yeah. Have you seen, do you see anything that we can learn across differences of elementary and secondary? Yeah. We have some different paths on that uh, gendered history. Yeah, that is so interesting because, because men continue to go into secondary education. In fact, through Throughout history, half of secondary teachers have been men, um, half women. Elementary school, ele- elementary teaching was the was the field that really became predominantly female up through to today. 
So the secondary teachers have a little bit more authority. Uh, they are also more subject-based, which gives them a seemingly sort of a cultural authority because they seemingly are seen to know something. Now, elementary school teachers know more than anybody. That first grade teacher I saw last week, she knew how to control 25 first graders. It was a, she was a genius. And yet that's not seen sort of in a cultural perception as, as, some, as really important knowledge. It's not as important as running a school, running a bank, um, or even uh, teaching biology or math. So that's our cultural perception that I think is screwing us up. And how have you seen that play out? How does that play out for the in the history of uh, school leaders? Yeah, that's interesting too because um, up until World War II, half of all elementary principals were women. Half of all elementary school principals are women. When we think of school principals today, we think of all men, and in fact, it's been predominantly men. Uh, it continues to be predominantly men, although we're moving. There are a few more women moving into the principalship now, but it, for the elementary school principalship, half of elementary school principals are women up until uh, World War II. This was partially because the elementary principalship was a, at that time, a much more informal position. They were essentially a head teacher. It was a teacher with more responsibilities. And then, as the position became gain, gained more um, legal and and political authority, also higher salaries. Um, and a little more formalized as a profession, that was when men were recruited into uh, the principalship. So that by the 1960s, uh, about 90% of all principals, secondary and elementary, were male. And like I said, now it's moving back a bit, too. And they're also, they were 90% male and mostly white, too, including in predominantly um, black schools and other minority schools. So the, so recruiting and encouraging women and people of color to move into the principalship is another initiative of the last few years that's a really good idea, um, uh, but it has been a real agenda item that people have promoted. You've um, also, uh, um, <clears throat> and I'm not sure how you want to, uh, your own sense on this, but one of the things that you've done, I think that's been, uh, distinctive as well is that you have encouraged uh, your U.S. based historians to uh, uh, step beyond their national borders a bit. Uh, yeah. And I'm just wondering, as a as a participant in on an international uh, basis, um, are there lessons around the history that you have found that you've stumbled across in other places uh, that might also be uh, something that we ought to keep in mind and can benefit from? Yes, that is a great question. There are all sorts of ways to be international, and they're comparative education people, and I'm not one of those. But what I do get from my work, in, meaning in not being comparative, what that means is I, I don't spend my time trying to compare what it's like to be a teacher in France versus a teacher in Brazil or a teacher in the United States. I find that useful, but that's not where I'm going with it. What I'm really interested in is this idea of transnationalism. Transnationalism goes beyond national borders and is more of a cultural and intellectual concept, thinking about how ideas transfer across regions. Mm -hmm. So, for example, how were, how were John Dewey's ideas implemented in um, India or Brazil? How was the work of educational researchers in England uh, transferred to some of the British colonies? And how, um, even beyond national borders, how were how were Scandinavian countries in general, how did they develop certain educational concepts or ways of thinking that are different than um, uh, maybe what had educational ideas that developed in Africa. So it's kind of about how regional ideas work and also how they translate and transfer transnational across different communities. It's quite interesting. Uh, it's provocative. I'm very reluctant to do this comparison thing. Again, the comparison thing a lot of educational policy people do, or some people do, which is the Japanese test scores are higher than our test scores. Right, right. That's that's to me is a false comparison. It's apples and oranges. The Japanese live in a world that's so different from ours. Their tests, their communities, their ways of thinking about education is so different than ours, we can't even begin to compare them. Mm -hmm. And yet that's how a lot of people do see international education. I think going... Thinking about different ways that different communities think about education is really helpful mm -hmm. for us. It kind of jostles up our way of thinking. Part of it too, I, th I, what I, I mean, I, um, 
found useful as well, and I think it speaks to other aspects of the work that you do on, on, within the U.S., has been the, the ways in which the institution of the school is understood in terms of other efforts. I think of when we were in a conference in Mexico and some of the work done there in terms of understanding the role of particularly elementary school uh, in the revolution and, and er, uh, periods just prior to and, and after that. Um, but I also think on this idea of the transnationalism, you know, the, the, um, the recent experiences in Chile around notions of choice, you get a notion there, very literally a chapter from from a University of Chicago professor Friedman who comes down to comes down to Santiago 40 years ago and, and people have this idea then that gets used yeah. in a different way when the institution itself is occupying different roles. Uh-huh. Um, I'm not sure if, you, that's, if that... Yeah, that... Yeah, that that's a kind of that tra- that's a transnational idea, a transnational adoption of the different ideas. But the other thing that of the many interesting things about that conference in Mexico that were that we went to together was uh, attending an academic conference on the history of education in Mexico. There were about fifty K twelve teachers who came to that conference, um, and it was their union because the Mexican Teachers Union is quite powerful as a professional organization. It was the union and the university that worked together to fund those teachers to come to that conference. That was really unusual for me because that was, that was, so there in Mexico, you know, we think we have an advanced education system. Well, they were the most advanced of all in trying to link teachers with educational researchers to think about new ideas about education, think about the history of education, but also new ideas about education. So that was an interesting just in- interesting experience, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but certainly that Chile situation, the notion of choice, the neoliberal, the promotion of neoliberal ideas about um, the role or the withdrawal of the role of government from public schooling, which is going on in England, across most of Europe, but actually probably most of the world to some extent, is certainly a transnational phenomenon. Mm-hmm. But it's being experienced differently in the different countries because of their own different traditions. As well as pushes in other directions around that. I mean, it's been very interesting to watch that happen, and to commute between, or to go go between, say, Santiago and New York, where there are, in some ways, um, uh, reactions against some of that work that that are getting institutionalized. And interesting yeah. Work. But so yeah. so let me. I, I've used up a good chunk of your your time, uh, and appreciate that. I want to leave you any chance to to offer any other nuggets uh, or thoughts or encouragements. Um, as people think about, uh, if, if, um, particularly we obviously will link to your works and everything else to try to encourage folks to, to dig into those further. But um, any sort of final thoughts as as folks who may not spend, uh, I don't know how they would resist spending the rest of their life reading history of education <laughs> or doing history of education. But should they resist that, uh, certain things that they ought to keep in mind as they as they yeah. think about what we want to do at schools. Yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, why would you do anything else except the history of education? <laughs> there you go. Well, <laughs> so one tip I have is to think about your own history of education. So history of education is not just looking at Horace Mann or, you know, educational leaders in Mexico or or, or Venezuela, but it's thinking about your own education. So when did you go to school? What, what, what decade was it? What was going on in that school? Um sort of try to get outside of your own experience of sitting in the classroom, although that in and of itself is a pretty powerful thing, too. And think about, who was that teacher anyway? Uh, I wonder, what was she married? Was she not married? You know, maybe she was married. Maybe she was divorced. Maybe she disappeared for, for a year because she had a baby. Who was the principal? What was the nature of the community involvement in my school? What were the racial dynamics in my school? Was my school all white or was it all black or was everybody from the same cultural or class background and why was that the case? Um, I really like uh, specifically asking about tracking. What is your experience about tracking? Because often people remember that they were friends with someone until sixth grade and then that kid disappeared. And oftentimes that kid was sent to the industrial school down the street um, or, or maybe was, you know, the tracking of... Uh, level A, B, or C, eagles, robins, turtles, <laughs> you know, and how kids are separated in that way. So so I think that's really interesting. Many people our age have memories of the day that Martin Luther King was shot and how our schools responded to that um, incident and other, just I think, it, I think it's really interesting to start there and to think about how we ourselves and our own um, lives are, in, are, we are the history of education and we can learn something from those 
from that from those memories. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. I love that. And and think about now what what was happening inside the school, and then what what were our fire engines that were passing by that brought yeah. us to the window to, to figure out what, what was going was on. What's your favorite? Uh, I love this particularly working in higher education. People always say, well, people aren't teaching kids enough in higher education. So then I say, really, tell me about your experience in college. <laughs> well, then, it usually has nothing to do with a classroom. It always has to do with a fraternity or the sorority or hanging out in the yard. You know, like when people think about what really mattered to them in education, it didn't always have to do with the classroom, for better or worse, but that's how it is. So we need to realign our way of thinking about what matters, yeah, Think, yeah. you know, respecting that. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Kate, as always, a huge pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this, and uh, um, um, look forward to, to future conversations. So, Good. Thank you Thanks so much. All right. <laughs> Take care.